<laughs> Welcome everyone to the Bloomington Rotary Club's weekly celebration of service for January 26th, 2021. I'm your current president, Ashley Wesley. Thank you for being here. Natalie, please show the flag graphic for 15 seconds of respectful silence. We ask that you remain on mute and take this time to personally reflect. Thank you. Is Charlotte Zidlow here? Yes, there she is. I'd like to introduce Charlotte who will be offering our reflection today. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Okay, yeah, okay, I, 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 I'm what, 80, Six, I keep calling myself 87, thinking that will maybe import more important, but I don't think it is. Anyway, I've lived in this country my whole, most of my life, but I've also lived in many other countries. I've lived in Switzerland, Germany, and Czechoslovakia for lengthy term, terms, periods of time, and also in Vienna, Austria, when it was a poor power thing. And I've always thought the United States is, you know, is. It's my country, it's a wonderful country. I believe in my country and I'm and, and always happy to get back to where people are resilient and uh, forgiving and so forth. But of course, things, sometimes things are harder than others, but uh, because our country has a constitution and what the th best part of the constitution is the, um, the first, the preamble, which of course starts, we the people, of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, come together, I'll just leave it at that, in order to form a more perfect union. Well, in, in the recent months, our perfect union has been, has been strained. And, and we, on January 6th, it really came under attack. But we survived, we're here today. And I wanna talk about what a per more perfect union might be. The, um, my, my parents-in-law devoted themselves to social justice. And I found in their papers, which I've been going through a booklet that, that says by, by different boats and it shows different boats from different countries where people came to our country by different boats. And there's, there's some information in here, some it's how to, how to get along with people that are different. It's kind of, a, it's amazing. It's just, you know, it's like it's 80 years old, I find. And what, what it instructs us to do is the following thing. Make, make, your, make it your business to make, to make friends with others. That's not, a, that's not too complicated. Make it Dear, excuse me, a piece of paper is missing. There it is. The first thing, make it your business to make friends. Study your community. Study your community. Cooperate with other groups. Do not, do not take, do not touch, approach anybody with suspicion. And, and refuse flatly to spread rumors. And finally, and finally, make it your business to understand your government. I think those are all principles that we can agree on. My, my father-in-law was a big Rotarian. Those were his principles. And I think they're principles by which we can live. And in the, um, at the inauguration, there was a young woman, Amanda Gorman, who read a poem that she wrote. And she, it's, it's a pretty complicated, long, long poem, poem. But it concludes by saying, by saying that there is always, we should always look for the lights because they're always there. If, she says, 
if we are brave enough to see it and we are brave enough to be it and her her um, her whole premise in her in her poem is that we, we, we are a country that wants to form a more perfect union. We do not have a perfect union, but we have the possibility of forming a more perfect union at all times. And, the, and that's what, if we are brave enough to see it, and if we are brave enough to be it, is, this, is the thesis of her, her speech, the, the, hill, the hill we climbed. So I'm here today to reflect on that and all the thoughts involved so long-term our country has always been working on this as, as attested by both the constitution and the little brochure that I found that was, was created in the 1930s. And today, a poem from Amanda Gordon. And it seems to me this is all part of what Ro Rotary aspires to as well. So that's my, that's my thesis, my program, for my reflection for today. Let us all reflect on that. Thank you so much, Charlotte. We have many, many guests with us today, and so I will not be introducing each one, but we do have groups of guests, uh, those that were involved with the toast and made it possible, those from the Bloomington North Rotary Club and the Bloomington Sunrise Rotary Club, thank you for being here today to celebrate with us, and many other members from the community, thank you for joining us. We hope that you'll come back again. You're welcome to be our guest any Tuesday at noon. And I'm sure a guest of our North and Sunrise Clubs, and we can connect you with each of those if you have interest. Thanks to our producers, Natalie Blaze, Michael Shermas, Sally Gaskell, Aaron Davis, and Alon Barker for making this program run smoothly. And our roundabout reporter, Kyla Cox Decker, this is her last week offering our wonderful roundabout reporting that keeps us all in the loop. We have a few birthdays. Jennifer Abrams today, past president Leslie Green tomorrow, and Judy DeMuth, January 30th. Happy birthday, Rotarians. Now we have a solemn announcement to share. Jim Bright, would you please offer a few words for us? Thank you, Ashley. Um, sadly, we uh, just learned this morning of the passing of fellow Rotarian and uh, past president Keith Klein. Um, I'm sure that all of you uh, knew uh, some of the many, many things that Keith did. Um, Keith, uh, besides being a past president here at Rotary, was um, a longtime member of the Monroe County School Board and uh, just talked to him recently and he had so many words of praise for our fellow Rotarian and Superintendent Judy DeMuth. Uh, he had just been named news director at radio station WGCL and um, he was uh, very happy to be serving in that uh, capacity. He was a, a national leader, uh, adult leader for the organization of D. Malay for uh, Christian young men. He had a great love for Ivy Tech and he, he taught there. He served as the chair of the communications department and uh, nobody loved his students more than uh, Keith Klein. Keith served as an MC for so many events, including our own uh, Bloomington Rotary Toast one year. Uh, every year he was the MC at the 4th of July and the uh, Christmas uh, lights uh, events in downtown uh, Bloomington. I used to swing by the uh, podium on the 4th of July where Keith was MCing and uh, would mouth uh, silently, happy birthday, Keith because his birthday was the 4th of July. During my year as president and district governor, Keith and I met regularly at a little coffee shop over on 3rd Street and nobody gave me uh, better and, and more good advice than Keith Klein. He touched my life. He touched uh, all of us in this room. We're gonna miss him and we'll give him a more proper eulogy um, uh, in, the, in a week to come. Thank you, Ashley, back to you. Thank you, Jim. We'll provide more information on details as we learn it. Now moving on to a happier occasion, we have a new member induction led by Dave Meyer. Dave? Thank you, President Ashley. Uh, this is in fact, uh, the one of the most fun things that we get to do as a Rotary family is an induct a new member, induct new members. 
So I, uh, I am honored to uh, induct Bill Marshall Brown, uh, principal architect uh, today into our Rotary family. After practicing public school, library and higher education design for 15 years, Bill served as Indiana University's first director of sustainability for nearly a decade. Two years ago, he started his own firm, Griffey Creek Studios LLC, focused on energy positive architecture. His po portfolio includes residential, commercial and public work. Bill participated in the greening of the White House in 1993 and his projects have won numerous state and national awards. He designed the first energy positive public library in America in 2008. Bill is also an adjunct professor in the IUJ Irwin Miller Architecture Program in Columbus, where he teaches energy and environmental design to the next generation of architects. Bill and his wife, Linda, Gra uh, Linda Brown, love to introduce their six grandchildren to, na to nature on their tree farm near Bloomington. Okay, now for the official part. Okay, Bill, on behalf of the board and the membership of the Bloomington Rotary Club, it is a great pleasure to welcome you as our newest member of the club. We look forward to the fellowship that you will share as well as your participation in many club projects that make our community, uh, country and world a better place. Though Rotary is not a political organization, uh, Rotarians are vitally concerned with good citizenship and the election of strong leaders to public office. While Rotary is not a religious organization, it's built on those eternal principles that have served as a moral compass for people throughout the ages. Rotary is an organization of business and professional people pledged to uphold the highest ethical and moral standards. Rotarians believe that the worldwide motto, the, excuse me, believe that the worldwide fellowship and peace can be achieved when people unite with a Rotary motto of service above self. Rotary activities exemplify the charity and sacrifice that one would expect from people who believe they have a responsibility to help others. Bill, you have been chosen for membership in the Bloomington Rotary Club because your fellow members believe you to be a leader in the community and because you possess the qualities to champion the message and principles of Rotary. You are a representative of your vocation within the club and community. You now become an ambassador of the Bloomington Rotary carrying the ideals of service to all within your sphere of influence. Our community will know and judge Rotary by your character and service. We will also look to you for inspiration as we strive to become better Rotarians. I now ask that you pen yourself with the distinguishing badge of a Rotarian, your rotary pen. Bravo. Okay, we ask that you wear your rotary pen with pride, not only to all rotary functions, but, to, uh, but in your many endeavors as a symbol of your commitment to rotary ideals and the recognition of your contribution toward a better world. Fellow Rotarians, please sit up straight in your chairs and welcome our newest Rotarian, Bill Brown. Welcome. Thank you, Dave, for that welcome. And uh, I'm honored to be a part of Rotary and also very grateful to Sarah Laughlin for sponsoring me. All right, well, welcome to the club, Bill. Thank you so much for joining us. And now I would like to pass it to Sarah Laughlin, who will kick off our toast presentation for today. Sarah. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I think I'm unmuted now. Um, and I just, uh, it, this is such a celebratory meeting. Every once in a while, even in the midst of a pandemic, we 
we have a chance to celebrate. And this is one of those moments with a new member, a new Paul Harris fellow, and a big check to give away. So we began the year by selecting Bob Hamill as the honoree for the sixth annual Rotary Toast. And he selected the Hoosier Hills Food Bank as the recipient of the proceeds. And then the pandemic. We were determined to continue to honor Bob and to support the food bank. But frankly, we truly had no idea how we could do it. So we reinvented everything. We held the toast via mandolin, a Bloomington company formed just a few months before in the early days of the pandemic to support performing artists and others. We offered delicious charcuterie boards. We even learned what a charcuterie board was. We recruited sponsors and viewers from all over the country, as it turned out. And we produced an evening that was elegant and memorable, even though we were watching at home. So today we celebrate as only Rotarians can do by honoring Bob again and all those who participated by writing, by giving away a big check to the Hoosier Hills Food Bank and learning more about what the food bank does to take hunger out of poverty in our community. So I just wanna start by thanking our toasters once again, starting with our own MC, Bob Zaltzberg, Dr. Richard Hamill, Bob's son, Carolyn Stewart Walters and Kay Stewart, Pete Yonkman, Anthony Thompson, Michael Carita, and Carrie Curry, and all the Rotarians who helped. You did help make a significant positive impact for our community. So now let me turn the microphone over to Brian Hain for a presentation. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'd like to do the presentation of the Paul Harris Fellowship in recognition. This is the recognition from the Rotary Foundations. Let's just start this over. <laughs> I'd like to, um, this is a presentation of the Paul Harris Fellowship from the Rotary Foundation, and it's a way of expressing our appreciation for a substantial contribution to its humanitarian and educational programs. The recognition is named after Rotary's founder, the late Paul Harris, a Chicago lawyer who started Rotary with three business associates in 1905. A world of goodwill and better understanding comes closer to reality today because you have made a substantial gift to the Rotary Foundation and a Paul Harris Fellow recognition may be presented. In being named a Paul Harris Fellow, Joe Throckmorton joins a remarkable company of people throughout the world all recognized for their commitment to service above self to benefit local and international communities. Joe was instrumental in producing this year's Rotary Toast, spending, and I can personally attest to this, spending countless hours recording video, uh, even more hours editing and producing it and creating that amazing virtual toast that we enjoyed. So I would personally like to thank Joe for all that he's done. And I'd like to say it gives me great pleasure, Joe, to present you which I believe you've already received with the emblems of the Paul Harris Fellow. We congratulate you and we thank you for your commitment to Rotary's common goals of world understanding and peace. And would you all please sit high in your chairs and give a big round of applause to Joe for all the hard work that he did this year. Thank you very much, Joe. And would you like to say something, Joe? Uh, well, thank you, Brian, and thank you, Sarah. Um, it was uh, a privilege for me to be able to uh, work with Rotary. Um, I have a, a very large number of friends who are involved with the Rotaries, uh, all the different organizations, including Michael Shermas. Um, but um, one of the reasons that I was so willing to become involved was because I uh, respect uh, and appreciate what the Rotary does, both in the community and also in the world uh, in terms of your, your worldwide efforts. So um, it was actually an honor to be asked to participate. Um, I can't thank uh, Brian and Jessica enough for all their assistance because they were there uh, every step of the way to help me. Uh, and I appreciate Sarah uh, uh, coming to me and asking in the, in the first place to be involved. Um, 
And uh, aside from us having a terrible uh, uh, accident with our drone footage <laughs> and that it was um, destroyed um, by the recording medium. Other than that, the entire experience was, uh, was quite good. And I would really like to extend my thanks to um, Bob Salzberg, who was an incredible and wonderful host, um, who made it just a complete joy to do the, the program um, elements that we absolutely needed to make this work, as well as Bob Hamill, uh, who it was a joy to get to know um, in the process of doing this. So um, that's a lot of thank yous, but thank you across the board. And I, I have my pin on. Uh, and I'm very proud and appreciative and thank you for that, uh, that honor. And I will display this in my office uh, and know that uh, the Rotary is appreciated and I'll do what I can uh, anytime I can to be of service. Thank you, Joe, so much. Now I'm gonna attempt to show just a brief segment of the, of the Toast video. Share screen first, Michael. Think. Yes. Make sure you share sound. computer sound. Optimize screen sharing. Okay, share. Maybe I needed to pick it first. Have it ready. All right, let's try this now. Share oh screen. yeah, there we go. Okay. We're Make good. it bigger. Make it bigger. Got it. There yeah. Thank you, Connie Shikalis again for that for that um, performance and I think never daunted is probably the the byword for the Rotary Toast in 2020. Um, so now I'm going to switch over to a PowerPoint if I can share my screen again. Find it. Just as a way of, again, reminding us that we had Bob Hamill, we had the drone shoot, we had so much fun, even though we didn't receive the result. We had these sponsors, Premier Healthcare, Cook Medical, Lakeside Art Class, Mark Dayton. Just thank you to all of the sponsors one more time. We could not have done it without you. <laughs> Already had that part. And there is the check amount. And I'm going to just come back to y'all with that number now because it's a little hard to read on the check itself. But um, we 
took a picture of ourselves presenting the check to the Hoosier Hills Food Bank this week for a total of $25,096. And that is the second largest toast check we've ever presented, even in a year of the pandemic. So we're very grateful for all the support that, that all of you provided for that. Um, and now what I would like to do is uh, welcome Bob Hamill to introduce Julio Alonzo for our um, presentation today. Am I on now? Here you are. Yes, okay. you are. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, thank you and uh, thank all Rotary for what has happened. I do want to precede my introduction of Julio by uh, pointing out something that probably most of you don't know. The, the lady sitting beside me is responsible for the rebirth of that uh, uh, bop lady at, at the Assembly Hall. Uh, we were sitting at a, at a women's game uh, several years ago with Tom Crean in his early years at, uh, at, at IU. And, he, and uh, he, he leaned back and said, uh, what do I have to do to get the, uh, uh, the spirit back? And Julie popped up and said, uh, bring the mop lady back. <laughs> and and uh, the, Tom had no idea what he, she was talking about, but he investigated and very soon thereafter that did uh, start reappearing with the things. It's so so that was a tribute to Julie, that, uh, and I've, I appreciated that. Uh, now, now I get the pleasant job of uh, introducing Julio Alonso, who's a 30-year friend of Julie and me. Uh, that's a long, long time, which he has been a day-to-day -day symbol of Rotary's great theme, Service Above Self. Uh, Hoosier Hills Food Bank has that not as a motto, but as its uh, very reason for being. Julio directs Hoosier Hills Food Bank uh, service to the people uh, in our community who need it the most isn't for Julio and those great people with him what it is for you and me. It's something that we want to do regularly and actually do to the extent we can when we see the opportunity to do it and when we think about it. Julio and his people think about it every day and, they, and do it every day. It's an honor I think the hottest, highest honor of my life to have been a part of this exceptionally well-timed assist. Yes, we all know that, of course, agencies like the food bank were extra strained in this COVID hampered year. The need, uh, always present and compelling, was greater than ever. And we know that, and we know that Hoosier Hills somehow manages to meet it. What we might not think of is, is how especially difficult it was to do that this year because the virus didn't just add to the need that Julio and the food bank stepped up to meet. It also subtracted substantially from even its annual usual income. One of my favorite uh, community events, the uh, October book sale at the fairgrounds was rescued from abandonment a few years ago by Julio and Hoosier Hills and the work of uh, Julio's people and the just plain amazing group of uh, community volunteers who have kept that book sale going all these years had to be canceled this year. And with that cancellation, the considerable income that helped Hoosier Hills do its work was lost. You Rotarians, with your generosity and hard work on this project, helped to offset that loss. So th thanks to you Rotarians and Julio, know that with this check goes an abundance of both the thanks of Julie and me and Bloomington Rotarians to you for the invaluable work you and your people do and our warmest wishes for a much better 2021, including return of the book sale. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, a high honor for me, truly, to be uh, introduced by someone like you, who is uh, uh, is definitely an, an idol of mine uh, and, and has been for a long time. Your support for uh, uh, 
for uh, hunger relief in this community goes back a, a long way, as you uh, as you mentioned, probably longer than either of us want to think about. But um, we really appreciate all the support you've shown, uh, both back when I was back at Community Kitchen and of the Food Bank and of the Book Fair over the years. So uh, it's an honor to be introduced by you. Um, I guess uh, I should can continue and provide you with a little bit of an overview. Um, when Sarah and I first uh, talked about this, we thought it would be good to, to give an overview of what uh, the year was like for the food bank. Um, before that, I would like to say how much I enjoyed the toast. Uh, it was a wonderful tribute to a very deserving honoree and uh, pulled off under very difficult circumstances. So congratulations to all of those involved in, in making this first and hopefully last virtual toast um, a, a big success. Um, great, great job, everyone. Um, this was probably, well, not probably, this was definitely the most unusual year um, I've ever experienced. I think a lot of people can say that, certainly true at the food bank. Uh, it really started for us back in March. Uh, we had our annual meeting scheduled for March 13th, where we were going to uh, announce that for the first time in 2019, we had distributed over 5 million pounds of food a huge milestone for us uh, that we hit for the first time in our 37 year history. Tables were set, food was ordered, whole event was, uh, was ready to go. And uh, then boom, came the word that uh, the gatherings were going to be limited and we had to do the responsible thing and, and cancel that event. At that time, if you can all remember back then, uh, which no one really wants to, um, everything was, was confused. Everyone was worried and scared. We were getting mixed messages from all over. Nobody really knew for sure what was happening and, and what was going to happen. Um, but we at the food bank did know, even before they classified us that way, that we were going to be essential workers, uh, that people were going to need food more than ever, and that we were going to have to step up and do more than ever. Uh, and so we immediately went to work trying to do that. Um, that required essentially completely reinventing ourselves um, from, from day one, um, reinventing all of our procedures and protocols. We're an organization that prides ourselves on providing our clients and our agencies with dignity, with allowing them to come through and choose the food that they want for, for their programs, for their, uh, their homes and tables. And all of that had to go out the window. Um, we immediately had to move to uh, pre-bagging and pre-boxing and, and pre-staging all food for clients and for agencies. And, uh, and that was a difficult step to take. And we also, of course, had to institute all sorts of other protocols, social distancing, personal protective equipment, sanitizing, um, all of those things to ensure that, that in the new normal, things could be done safely. Another major change is that we're an organization that relies on uh, at least eight solid interns from Indiana University every, uh, every semester, as well as 2,000 volunteers a year. They were gone overnight. Um, we had to immediately adapt to the loss of that support. Fortunately, we had the National Guard deploy, de deployed to help us out uh, between March and December, and that was a lifeline that we, we just couldn't have gotten by without. Uh, but it was also a very, very strange uh, and surreal uh, experience to be supervising National Guard troops as our, our volunteers in the food bank. Um, but we're very grateful for, for the support that they provided us. And of course, um, our food supply. We uh, rely uh, very heavily on donated food. That's our mission, to go out and rescue food in the community, get it out to people who need it. Well, a lot of those sources dried up, uh, again, almost overnight. Um, all food drives went away. Our biggest food drive, the, the Stamp Out Hunger food drive in May was canceled. Um, restaurants closed. Our meal share program for prepared food rescue dried up immediately. Retail food donations. If you remember what the shelves at grocery stores looked like back then, um, there was no excess to share with us. So uh, our food from local donated sources went down about 25%. Um, and that was something that we had to make up for largely by doing food purchasing. So we started raising the money to do that right away. In a normal year, again, we rely on donated food, not purchasing food. Our purchasing budget's about $90,000 in a normal year. Last year, we spent over $1.1 million purchasing food 
through the generosity of a lot of grants and community donations that, uh, that enabled us to do that. Um, our partner agencies, of course, had to adapt as well, uh, implementing all of their, uh, their safety protocols and moving from, uh, from client choice to pre-bagging and pre-boxing their, their food distribution. And we did our best to help them make those adjustments as well with uh, personal protective equipment, with grants for capacity building for, for extra salaries, for, um, for refrigeration and, and freezer space to, to handle increased amounts of food. And of course, our goal was to, um, to get them as much food as possible. We also undertook a number of uh, unusual steps. Um, the biggest one was to move toward doing a lot of direct distributions ourselves. In a normal year, um, our goal is mainly to support the 100 partner agencies we work with in six counties, get them the food that they need to distribute out into the community. The, the need was much greater this year, so we took the, the extra step in addition to supporting those partners of doing um, 12 direct distributions of food, starting at College Mall in May and then moving over to the food bank um, through November. We wound up doing 12 of those. Started out that first time at College Mall serving 465 households. Throughout the course of the summer, we saw that progress from week to week to week, moving up to 500, 600, 800, 900, 1100 households um, every time we, we did those distributions. And the last one we did uh, in November in partnership with Pantry 279, we served over 1500 households uh, in November with, with food. Um, over the course of that time, we distributed food to over 10,425 households. Um, something again, completely new and, and unusual for us because we normally try to support our agencies um, with food as much as possible. Um, when all was said and done, um, I, I um, was not sure at the beginning of, of uh, last year that we'd be able to make, meet that 5 million pound mark again, uh, that record distribution. And um, as it turns out, we distributed over 7 million pounds of food last year, uh, a 39% increase over 20, our record in 2019. Um, absolutely unbelievable and something I, I never would have expected to see and something that we, we couldn't have done without the community support that, um, that we had. Um, those are really the numbers and the statistics of what we did. Um, I don't think I can adequately explain in the time here the, the stress and psychological toll um, of this entire um, uh, event on me, on my staff, um, on our supporters, on our agencies, um, knowing that we did not have the opportunity to work from home, that we had to get out there and get that food out to many more people who, who uh, were in need of it. Um, came with a, with a great deal of pressure, but we were able to do that because we live in one of the most generous communities that there is, um, where people stepped up, uh, organizations, government, um, individuals, uh, companies across the spectrum to make it possible for us to do this. And um, throughout the, um, the fall, we were of course trying to work with Rotary to plan this event, um, which, which um, just <coughs> hope brings home the importance of, uh, of this donation uh, and how much support it, it gives to the food bank and to our ability to provide this vital community service. We can't do it without that, that kind of community support. And the fact is, this isn't over. Um, we're still out there providing a lot of support to our partner agencies and getting food out um, as long as necessary till we can, can hopefully all be vaccinated and, and move, move beyond this back to a a better normal once again. Uh, so again, uh, we can't underestimate the uh, appreciation that we have to you, Bob, for choosing us as, as your, uh, your charity, to Rotary and all the Rotarians who put in so much work and effort um, during a, a very difficult time to pull off a, a new kind of event and to do so spectacularly and to thank you and all of those who supported this event um, to raise over $25,000 for Hoosier Hills Food Bank, which will have a significant impact and enables us to go forward and continue providing the kind of service that we need to, 
to people in need for um, for as long as, as we possibly can. So I thank you all very much for your support. Sarah, thank you for, for inviting me today and uh, I'm, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions if that's appropriate that, that anyone has them. But thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Julio. We have several minutes here for questions if anyone would like to ask. This is Glenda. Julio, you had talked about um, the National Guard and I gather that they are all gone and I saw that you had been requesting uh, more help. Can you tell us a little more about how you're coming on getting volunteers back? Sure, Glenda. Um, it's been a slow process, um, and it's it's a two-edged sword. Of course, we're you know we're not welcoming um, groups of of thirty or forty or fifty people uh, like we used to. We you know we loved having those groups in. We needed them, um, but we can't do that. It's just not safe anymore. So uh, we're we're uh, we've scaled it back. We're we are definitely in need of volunteers, but we've reduced any group sizes to more like five or six at a time as a maximum. We screen all of our volunteers to ask them the appropriate um, uh, COVID related questions to make sure that we're, we're being safe. And of course they have to follow all the, the appropriate protocols. But um, with the loss of the guard, we definitely still need that support. We're a small staff of 14 people um, various different times, as unfortunately was the case with me last week, people are out quarantining from exposure, from illness, from, from this, that, or the other thing, just to, to make sure everyone stays safe. So um, we're, we're not always at even that full 14 staff capacity. And, you know, when you rely on 2,000 volunteers a year and they're suddenly gone, uh, it, it, it makes a big impact. So we are looking for volunteers um, at specific times. Lots of good information on our website to help us uh, pack boxes for, for clients, to help us stage food for the agencies um, and, uh, and do a few other tasks. So um, it's not coming along as quickly as we would hoped, but um, we, we certainly understand that. Um, people are being cautious and, and need to be, um, but we're gonna continue doing what we need to do and uh, hopefully we'll be able to, uh, to get some more volunteers in um, over the course of the spring. Yeah. And did you want to talk about your big fundraiser, the virtual Super Bowl? Well, I would be delighted to talk about that um, because we are um, actually, uh, with the help of Mandolin again and Robert Midas, my good friend, um, uh, undertaking to do what you folks did so successfully and, and, and make our most important uh, community event a virtual event this year. Um, the Soup Bowl benefit, the 27th annual, will take place on February 21st this year, um, but it will be a virtual event. Um, uh, again, working with Robert to make it a success. There will be bowls. They're available to, to be picked up. Uh, we can't, unfortunately, have soup. We haven't figured out a way to do that um, successfully yet and safely, but we'll have bowls. We'll have a great program with lots of music and, and good information. Tickets are available at our website, hhfoodbank.org. More details there. And uh, piggybacking on that, I put in the chat, we have taken on a volunteering session next Wednesday at the Food Bank, uh, February 3rd. We have a slot for seven available from four o'clock to 5.30 p.m. So you can let me know if you'd like to sign up or just click in the Sign Up Genius there in the chat and take a slot. And I would just like to say that Robert Midas was with us for this, um, for this meeting. I didn't see his, his, uh, his name there on the screen when I looked, but he just left. So I, I hope he got to hear what you had to say there, Julia. Me too. All right, are there any other questions or comments? I've got one, have I got time, Ashley? Yes, go ahead. Um, Julio, I would assume that you and your staff would be considered essential workers. Has there been any efforts to vaccinate people and um, including even volunteers or whatever? Uh, well, we're, we're hopeful. Um, 
Mike, we uh, we are considered essential workers. We were as you know as part of the governor's um, series of executive orders. Um, we were initially told that we would be sort of lumped in with grocery workers and um, and and other food providers as well. Um, you know, I, I think uh, I don't want to be critical because I think the state is doing the best it can to manage a difficult situation, and we all know that there just isn't enough vaccine available, um, and. Um, we uh, in Indiana opted to go with a system that would protect our most vulnerable first and start working with by age rather than by um, by occupation. And so I think they're working through those. Um, we haven't had any word yet about when we might be next in line, but I'm, I'm hoping that that will come soon um, because it, it, it really is important to get my staff and, and our volunteers vaccinated. Um, I will tell you, that was probably the greatest strain for me throughout this, uh, this entire uh, period of the last nine months or so was having to look my staff in the eye and tell them that they had to come to work, um, that, uh, that they were needed. Um, these are people who have children at home, um, who have other things going on in their lives, and um, they performed a great service for our community and I'm very grateful to them. So I have a question. So Julio, it's Liz. I'm wondering um, as you continue and we all continue to pass the pandemic phase, how do you think the food bank's um, MO might uh, change or be modified as you continue past that? Are there things that have happened that you think you'll continue or uh, you'll just go back kind of the way it was or what, what are you seeing in that future? Are you thinking about that yet? Well, we're only thinking about it a little, to be honest, because we're we're still trying to get through. Um, we're, as I said, this isn't over yet. Um, but one of the major changes we have made is we've been able to um, implement a, a new inventory management system that allows our agencies to actually go online, see our inventory, and place orders for the food that they want. Um, we weren't able to do that during most of COVID. Um, they essentially had to take what we were able to to, to choose for them and and provide them and you know we worked with them as much as possible but um, but now we've got this new system in place so it's going to be much more efficient and um, we'll work a lot better for the agencies and allow them to again choose the food that they want um, and distribute and then we can stage that and distribute it out to them there are definitely changes that come with that um, and one of those is you know we need that support to have people to help stage that food, to get it ready for those agencies every week. That wasn't something we necessarily needed before because agencies would be coming through and, and selecting it themselves. Um, we're never going back to that, um, that kind of a system, um, but we do at least now have a system where we can provide them with choice. There'll be other things that, um, that we change going forward, but I do hope most importantly that we'll be able to get back to, to letting those clients have that that same choice option as soon as possible as well, as soon as we can do that safely. And my follow up, maybe what about um, any new agencies? Have there been new agencies that you've uh, had the opportunity to add on as a result of all this or you're sticking with what kind of what you had? Uh, there have been a few new agencies that, um, that stepped up as, um, uh, in, as part of this. Um, we, uh, I, I couldn't name them for you right now, but I know we had a couple of new ones that, um, that developed programs that, um, that we're working with, in addition to the, um, the others that we've been working with for a long time. I have a question. Is it not possible to uh, have a food drive or canned, canned and box foods? It is now possible, so yes, we are. Postal workers caught up on their Christmas thing and maybe they'll get enhanced uh, support from the government. Thank you, Charlotte. We're, we're hopeful that the, the Stamp Out Hunger food drive will take place this year. We don't know that for sure, but it's, it's looking better than it, um, than it was. And we are, um, again, supporting and, and accepting food drives as well. So we do encourage people to do that. Obviously, we take the proper precautions and quarantine the food uh, once it's it, it's collected uh, before it's sorted and distributed, uh, but we are accepting food drives again, and we encourage people to to do that for us. Michael Shermis. Yeah, um, uh, Julia, I'm I'm just kind of curious uh, uh, because I've gotten heard this um, out there occasionally. When you uh, 
tell about the record uh, numbers for distribution. Um, I see much reason to have pride in that because it shows that uh, our community is phenomenally generous and you guys are phenomenally organized in being able to get it out to all the agencies and other people who need that uh, food. What do you say when people say, when you say we distributed, you know, and give that giant number and people have said, that's terrible that we need that much food to be distributed, that there's that many people that are hungry, that there's that much need out there. That's a, that's a, that's terrible for the community that looks bad. And so how do you respond to that? So that, you know, I don't know, what do you say? Well, um, what I say to those people is you're absolutely correct. It is terrible. It's, it's t you know, I wish we didn't have to exist, <laughs> quite frankly, um, but we do and, and we always will. Um, I've very, been very careful um, throughout my 15 years at the food bank, 15 years tomorrow, actually, um, at the food bank to, um, to say in a normal year, um, our numbers are not always reflective necessarily of an increase in need, but of an increase in capacity, that we've never completely met the need, but that we're able to build our capacity from year to year and do more. Um, this year, that is, is absolutely not the case. There was a huge increase in need. Um, cl um, clients increased at our, our own mobile pantries, at the agencies we were serving, at these mass food distributions that we did. There were clearly a lot of people impacted by this pandemic um, and, and the, the economic effects of it. And um, I am just incredibly grateful that we had a community that allowed us to rise to that challenge and, and meet that need. So it always is um, uh, somewhat of a blessing and a curse when we talk about our, our numbers um, this year the numbers definitely reflected a huge increase in need, but they also reflected a big increase in generosity and support. And I think that is something that we can all be proud of as a community. And one may, maybe final thing, I have a question about like the money that you just received today or whenever you actually got the check, uh, how much, uh, how many meals or pounds of food or however you do it, can you tell us the impact that that brings? Um, I, I'm always really reluctant to, to do that, Liz. I, I don't like to tie dollar numbers specifically to, um, um, to the, the number of meals um, pr uh, provided because it, it, you know, a pound of food doesn't necessarily equal a, a, a meal. Um, but, but, what, about the, um, those, what about the pounds? Can you, can you translate that in pounds maybe? Those 7 million pounds of food we distributed last year um, uh, constitute probably the equivalent of, uh, of uh, between five and a half and six million meals um, throughout the community. So um, okay. every day that we were open, we were able to distribute over 20, uh, 21,000 meat, the equivalent of 21,000 meals yeah. to the community. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you. We're going to close our program officially now. Julio, do you have a few minutes to stay after if we have any additional questions? Uh, sure. Okay. Plus, Ashley, can I make one final announcement that I should have made yes. <laughs> earlier? And that is um, the 2021 toast is underway. I never thought I'd live to say that, but I have. Um, and so I want you to reserve November 5th on your calendar for the seventh annual Rotary Toast. And um, more, many, many, many more details to come as we, as we work through the next few months. Hoping it's in person, but maybe, maybe a little online, online-ness too. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Sarah. Okay, uh, Sally, would you tell us about next week's program? Uh, so of course, every industry has been affected by the pandemic. Next week, um, we'll hear from Kate Galvin, Artistic Director, and Gabe Gloden, Managing Director of Cardinal Stage on running a theater company during a pandemic. Thank you. Natalie, will you share our four-way test graphics? We can say this together, wrap up our meeting. Of the things we think, say, and do. First, is it the truth? The truth. Second, is it, is it, 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 it all concerns? 
Third, fourth, 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 fourth,